come on in. Hey, and welcome to today's garden class here at Waters Garden Center. We are so glad that you are tuned in. Uh, my name is Ken Lane. I'm the owner of the garden center. So I'm the second generation owner. So my father-in-law, Harold Waters, started the business back in 1962. I got some tennis elbow. I tell you what, if you lift these up like this often enough, it wears on your elbows. <laughs> so, oh my goodness. So uh, anyway, he, he uh, Harold and Lorna Waters started the business back in 1962, the very first garden center in Northern Arizona. Back in that, those days, the 50s and 60s, basically it was baseline down to Phoenix. They had a bunch of garden centers and that was it for the state. And so Harold wanted to move up here and he just started a, a garden center. And so it's just grown as a community grows, we grow with it. And so now I've got four kids and three dogs working in the business. So the, the third generation's coming in. I don't know how you count dogs in there, but you'll see a black lab floating around. Vincent's here, greeting, saying hi, looking for treats. So if you're a dog person, just go, here you go, Vincent. Here's a, here's a dog treat. Uh, he'll, he'll follow you around until you, he'll probably go home with you. So anyway, that's, that's the garden center. Uh, we're into autumn. And so we're already seeing, can you hear the cicadas in the background? I don't know if you can hear those online, but they're those uh, big old bugs that uh, sing in chorus. Already you're starting to hear them. They're, they're less and less and less. So they're starting, they've laid their eggs. They're starting to die off. And now the eggs will hatch, drop to the ground. And the larva, which is a great big old ugly looking thing, will live in the ground for like four years. And they come back. That's kind of the cycle of those. But you can always tell autumn is here when the fall colors show up. When the cicadas start to, they'll be gone in a couple of weeks. You just won't hear them at all. So we're here with fall. There's some things that you need to do in the fall to kind of get your landscape ready at this altitude. It's kind of different than other parts of the country. I thought we'd just go over that list. And I did get the handout for you note takers. I have, I printed 20 of them. I think I've got enough, which is perfect. So I've got, I've got this is the list that we're going over. Make sure I leave one out for me. There's one for you. Just take one and pass it on that way. Perfect. Um, so, and then online, folks, look inside your. Uh, did I, I, this is a. This was a uh, doc file that I printed. Did you get it? Okay, perfect. So you'll see the PDF format or web link or something. You've got it too. We're trying to include you, although you're not quite as special as our VIP customers, virtual in-person customers, uh, but uh, or students. That's the list. Uh, what we have, this is fall. We will have our first frost. Usually the locals use Halloween as the first frost date. So it, last year was a couple weeks later. It can be a little bit earlier. And it depends on your elevation. I know Flagstaff and Williams, White Mountains gets, gets sooner, mid-October. But we're starting, in fact, I heard that the, the White Mountains, the uh, ski slope sunrise, already got a dusting of snow. So that just happened a little bit early but that we're on track. You're feeling the, the cool air. And so you need to prepare for that first frost, then also for your first freeze, which will be towards Thanksgiving. You'll start having some hard freezes. By then, the fall color, your, your aspens are kind of done. They're now naked, they're deciduous. And so that's kind of the sequence. So our first and last frost, so Mother's Day is our, our last frost. Halloween is usually our first frost. So if you, that's your, and then everything in between is our growing season. So this is an opportunity because plants are actively growing roots. It's why it's such a good time to plant. So if you're putting big trees, shrubs, we've got an order of very large spruce coming in, pine, next week. Uh, we also have our, our 2022 potteries coming next week, I hope. The supply chain thing is it's a real thing. So actually it's another 2020. That's our spring order finally getting here. It's very irritating, but uh, we'll have potter. Things will start happening here next week. Uh, so it's a good time to plant. So if you're new to the area, you think, oh, I'm from Huntington Beach, and I, it will be cold. I can't plant. That's not the case. You just have to plant things that like the cold, and we'll go over some of those for you. Um, as plants turn color, they're starting to take that food, that, that starch, and they're taking that, and they're, they're actually rooting out pretty aggressively towards the end of the year right now. So that's why it's such a good time. You can get extra, you can get an extra foot of root growth on those plants, which will play out well for you next spring because now you've got more root structure to, that's just gonna be a problem, isn't it? You can do that or do I do that by myself? 
Let's see. Oh, it's the wind. Ah, there we go. Sorry about that. We're trying to look good for you folks online. So just trying to be more professional, professional audio, professional, better cameras. Uh, this uh, digital thing really played out strong in 2000 since COVID. A lot of folks are online doing stuff. So we just passed our millionth view, uh, millionth download. That's even better. Download on YouTube. Uh, passed our 10,000 follow Facebook follower. It's gone nuts. So this whole digital thing is it's nuts. So we're trying to get better at it. Uh, so what do we do? Let's start with list number one. I'm pretty sure it is. Fertilize everything. You need to fertilize. It is so important, if, especially you folks from the East Coast, Midwest. You're used to topsoil, like eight foot topsoil. We have eight millimeters. And then what little was there, they scraped it off and made room for your footers and your driveway and everything. So some of you are literally dealing with dead soil. There's not one living thing in the soil, not one worm. No mycorrhizal colonies, there's not one good thing in the soil. It's just sitting there dead. So sometimes you can plant things and it will just sit there. It doesn't grow for three years. It's still the same size. Hasn't grown, hasn't died, hasn't grown. That's a dead soil. So you need to en enliven or, or enrich that soil. And then you need to fertilize way more often here than you ever do any, any place else uh, because the plants are using up the nutrients that you're giving them. So there is no nutrients in your soil. There's no good stuff. Food, there's, no, there's nothing down there. And so what to do, uh, before October, you wanna give them this stuff. Let's put you folks online. This is all-purpose plant food. We make two foods here. One's called all-purpose. This is the original. We've been selling this for decades. Uh, it's, it's an organic food that we blended for, for here. The beauty with, all, with organics, we're all natural foods, is they break down much longer, over a longer period of time, much slower, and the plant can pick up all the food. Whereas chemicals or petroleum-based type of fertilizer, like your Scots, North, those, those things, um, those are fast to release, so water hits those. They release within weeks, if not days, and, and much of that food goes through the root zone, the plant can't pick it up, or it washes downstream and goes downstream. So use organics, use, use good, good, strong organic fertilizers because you're gonna break down longer, which means you're gonna feed your plants longer. So this you're gonna put down now, and it'll feed through the end of the year. That's gonna be really important for your evergreens. Even your natives, I tell folks, feed, including those ponderosas, pinion pines, junipers, they've been under stress. Uh, they went from two years of drought to now they're drowning to death. Literally, they had too much water. So they adapted to dry, and now they're, they're now too much water. So we're seeing some yellowing. We're seeing some not fall color yellow. We're seeing stressed out yellowing the leaves, thinning out of the inside of that trunk. Those are all indications of overwater. So fertilize those things. That'll help you next spring to have more growth. Uh, also, we make a fruit tree food, this, uh, this edible thing. Uh, fruit trees, berries, grapes, this is a big deal. So it's just one of our fastest growing departments uh, here in the garden center. And so we made a fruit tree food that's completely organic. And then we upped the uh, calcium. It's a 6447. We put an extra number on there because 7% of that fertilizer is calcium. Calcium is what brings out the size and the flavor of edible things, tomatoes, that kind of stuff. So, so whatever, just take food, fertilize everything. And don't use water-soluble foods. Get rid of that. miracle Grow is not a food. Don't waste your energy or time on that, especially in the fall. Go with a granular food, and, and I recommend going organic. And I recommend buying it from Waters Garden Center. So come on down and get yours today. So anyway, just it, it does play out. That's the most important thing. Things that are stressed. Uh, I was helping a gentleman yesterday. Some, he's planted uh, several living Christmas trees over the, over the years, and two of them are really stressed out. They were seeing drought to over wet, and, and the bottom of the plant was hideous looking. The top started to recover. You could tell it was just totally stressed. I told him, go look at grubs, look for bugs, and that kind of stuff. But for those plants, in addition, I think the plant, the crew gave this to me. In addition, at the same time, use Humac. This is the, does that show up on the camera okay? Humic is uh, humic acid. So humic is, uh, it, it helps the plant 
root. It, it feeds the soil. So the worms, your mycorrhizal colonies, they're going to love being in there. They're going to go, oh, wow, something's going on with the soil. So it's actually feeding the, the, the soil, not the plant. But when the plant sees the soil act actively alive, it goes, whoa, there's something going on. I should root out further. It must be safe, and it starts to root. The food is what actually feeds the plant, gets you longer candle growth. This stuff is dirty. I'm putting this down. Uh, humic feeds the soil so the roots start to grow out, and the all-purpose food gets the top growth, so you get longer candle growth, better flower buds, larger leaf buds next spring. So you do both at the same time. It doesn't matter which one, just get them on. And the secret, I find the biggest mistake with fertilizers, everyone's focused in on the trunk of that plant. Don't You don't have to put any fertilizer towards the trunk of the plant. There's no feeder roots there. All the feeder roots are out towards the drip line. So if, if my branches are way out here, focus on the outer tips to halfway to the trunk. That's where most of that food needs to be at, on a shrub, a tree, any of that kind of stuff. Even if it's 10 feet out, that's where the roots are. That's why, that's why plants got so stressed during that drought. They were dying because the irrigation was still here, but all the roots had taken the water and the nutrients, they're out there in the drought and the plants died. So focus out where the drip line is. And if you've got fabric, rocks, that kind of stuff, which a lot of us do, don't worry about it. The fabric is meant to allow food and water to go through but to keep the weeds from coming out. So just get it on. Get, get it on the plant. You don't have to work it in. Some of you gardeners, you'd like, you got to make work out of everything. You have permission to go rake it in and go, oh, work, work. Me, I just chuck and go. I'm off to mountain biking or doing something else, working, watching kids stuff. So just get it on. It doesn't matter. If you've got plastic underneath the rock, which we don't use very much anymore, but if you've got an older house, Let's say it's from the 90s, early 2000s. Back then, we used to use 10 mil plastic underneath the rock. And then we put the, the rock on top of that. Uh, food and water don't go through plastic. There we tell folks, take a pitchfork or poke holes or peel it back to the drip line so the plant can actually receive the food and the water. So most of us are dealing with, with landscape fabric. Uh, there's woven. There's a couple different types, but they both will allow food to go through the through the fabric, along with the water. So then you're praying for snow and rain. We had a run on fertilizer this weekend, uh, last weekend, because of the rain. The gardeners are going, oh, this is great. They started running in. In the rain, they're spreading fertilizer. So that's you want to do that uh, sometime before the end of this month. That's ideal. Okay. Number two, plant protector. Oh, my gosh. So bark beetle has been terrible. Bark beetle and grubs, we're starting to see a lot of different kind of bugs, which is great. Um, we, I was really worried about bark beetle taking out entire tracts of the forest. It did do a lot of damage, uh, but that's a, a Ips beetle. You'll see a, a tiny pinhole in, in the evergreens mainly. They like the taste of evergreens. Uh, and then they, they live underneath the bark of the tree, and they'll eat that cambium layer underneath the bark. And so finally the plant gets, gets girdled. It actually cuts all the live tissue, and the tree dies. It's very easy to solve as long as you can spot the issues. Uh, so plant protector is something we made, again, years and years ago. Uh, this is a systemic. You mix it up in a watering can. You don't have to be an arborist to do this. You can do it yourself. Uh, but mix it up in a watering can. You pour it right at the trunk, right at the base. And the plant actually absorbs this through the bark and through that crown area takes it up underneath the bark and kills off the bark beetles. If you built your house around the ponderosas, you've got a built-in deck around that, or you've built your house in that huge, glorious, 300-year-old pinion pine, uh, you, you really want to take care of those. Because if you lose them, there's no recovery from that. Take care of those, especially so food, plant protector, anything you've had stress with, plant protector, anything you've had aphids with, plant protector, this is the time of year you put this on. One application should get you through the winter, through next spring, and, and all the bugs that happen thereafter. So do this now, So by the end of the month. That's number two. Gosh, it's so, it's so easy when I just have a checklist. In fact, just go home and read this. You'll be fine. 
There you go. You folks, stay tuned. We got more for you because you don't have this list because you're not here. But number three is uh, Roundup. Okay, Roundup. Do not use Roundup. First of all, it'll kill you. Causes cancer. It does cause cancer. It is terrible for your dogs. Terrible for birds. Terrible for the environment. Why they sell lots of stuff? Why they still sell it? I don't know. Um, and it doesn't work in the fall of the year. When it gets below 60 degrees at night, you don't even waste your time. It's not going to kill it. It'll yellow it, and it will come back. That weed will come back with a vengeance, but not decimate. Decimate actually is a competitor to Roundup, and it does not cause cancer. It, it actually is more effective in the when the nights are cooler. For mountain gardens, this is the one you want to use even in the summer. Uh, this will kill down to, I think you can go down to 30 degrees or so until frost. Uh, and this will still kill your plants. Here's why you want to focus on weeds right now. Most of your fall weeds are perennial. They come back year after year. So your, your uh, whorehound, or, or they form seeds, but usually the, the perennials, the root will actually come back. So by the end of the month, they're going to go into fall color. They're going to hibernate underground, just like all the other perennials you have in your gardens. You're going to hibernate underground, and then they're going to come back next spring. You don't have an opportunity to kill them. You've got an opportunity for the next two, three weeks to kill off the weeds in the yard. Then they're going to hibernate and come back and haunt you next spring. So I really focus heavily in my own gardens on the weeds in my yard. I either take a hoe or spray them or something. So we're focused at the garden center right now, killing off as many weeds as we can so we go into winter clean, weedless, so we have less issues next spring. Decimates what you use. So... It's stronger, so this is a, you mix it up in your watering can and, or in your uh, uh, pump-up sprayer, um, and then you just go spot treat. This kills the root and everything without affecting the soil. So you can spray this right up into the trunk of a tree. It's not gonna kill the tree, just the weeds that are underneath there. So it doesn't get into the soil, it gets through the, the root zone of that plant. With that being said, be careful because I have killed one of my rosemaries with this. I was kind of lackadaisical, and I just kind of let the overspray, kind of had some weeds coming up. It was a ground cover rosemary. Some weeds were coming up towards the edge. I went, ah, oh, it'll be fine. It wasn't fine. So, so use a shield or something. Sometimes I'll take a piece of cardboard and go, ah, oh, to keep it from floating over. It wasn't the soil. It didn't get into the soil. It got onto the foliage, tracked back into the main heart of the plant, killed it dead. Luckily, I own a garden center, so I could replace it real easy. But yeah, don't do that. It was a it was a big one. It'll take me two years to recover from that. So just kind of watch. This will kill everything: grass, weeds, your perennial flowers, whatever it is. Just be careful. But it's highly, highly effective for mountains. Uh, I brought this to for me. This is what I do. I put spreader sticker and the decimate inside the same container. This is a wetting agent. This is the killer. What happens is a lot of the weeds, especially nutweed, sedge, that kind of stuff right now has a real waxy leaf to it. And so the, the product will go on there on the foliage and ball up and fall off because the, the leaves are so waxy. This gets keeps it from, this is a sticker or, or extender. It coats the foliage so you get a faster knockdown, faster kill, and, and broader kill. This just makes this work better for an extra, you know, five, seven, eight bucks makes this go crazy. So I always mix them together. Okay, there we go, weeds, we got that, yeah. Yeah, hey Don. So what I do, so I've got dogs, not just dogs, I have puppies. Puppies are the worst. They chew on everything, they're, wherever you are, they're there. With this, what I do is I'll keep them off the area until it's dry, which what, about 15 minutes? And then I let them back out in the gardens. So I would say you, common sense. Don't spray the dog bowl. I mean, do common sense stuff. But keep them out of the area until it's dry, and then you should be perfectly fine. I haven't lost a puppy yet. And if any animal gets harmed in our, in our uh, there's a divorce coming. It's over for me. It's just out. So you got to make sure you're really, the, the, the animals are happier than your kids even. So, okay, aphids. Oh, man, aphids are out right now. And it's a great big aphid. If you're seeing a, a glossy, it looks like the rocks are wet underneath the plant, like pine trees, 
aspen apples. Seen them on a lot of different things. There's a great big black, looks like a spider almost. But it's a, it's a tree aphid. They like to get into the, not so much the roses, but into the trees. And so you'll see this glossiness or excrement, call it aphid poo, come in, they drip down, and it's really they're sucking the sap out of that tree, and then it drops down on the ground. It makes it look real glossy. You can spot the hood of your car. You park underneath some of the elm trees. You'll see the spotting on your windshield. Those are all aphids. If you see that, just be aware they show up. They love it when it's cool, humid, Moist, this is the perfect growing environment for aphids. Just watch it, and if you see them, spray them. So spray them with, anything will kill an aphid. Whatever you do, don't, don't listen to the internet. The internet, some of that stuff, about 10% of it's real and accurate. The other 90%, they're idiots. I don't know where they're getting this stuff from. Don't just hose off an aphid. They crawl right back up the same day and do the exact same thing. Don't waste your energy. If you're going to add water, add a... Add a Use sayonara. Say goodbye to aphids. If you're going to spray the tree with, with the water, add sayonara. It'll, it'll actually kill the insect, and it keeps them off. So aphids are winged. So they'll actually fly in. And then aphids also, a little trivia, they're the only insect that will give live birth. So they're actually, so you'll see different stages of, of, of aphids, smaller ones to bigger ones, all within the same colony. And so... Tree aphids, they all they take on the color of the bark that they're eating. So they'll have this usually this black or brown look to them. And the only way you can see them is you'll see the bark sort of moving towards the top, towards the, the upper ends. It looks like the bark is moving. That, those are tree aphids. They attack a tree by, you can have no aphids, and then within two weeks, thousands, because they, they're so active. They're so prolific in how they, they, and they can do damage. They generally don't kill the tree. What they do is they'll damage it where the tips get, get damaged. So anyway, you don't want aphids. Get rid of them. Sayonara makes them go away. Okay. Oh, yeah. So some of my plants are starting to fade. So this was not a good pumpkin, zucchini year. Maybe you had some great success, but mildew was, powdery mildew is everywhere. It's been so wet that it was harder to grow. The peppers loved it. The tomatoes went crazy. But as I see plants stress out, I'm starting to dig those things up and get them out of there. That frees up some space. As you see that, take advantage of that and put your manures for next spring. Everyone waits until spring to put their manure, two, three inch layer of organics onto their gardens. Do it now. Don't wait, do it now. Let it sit there and enrich the soils now. So as I see that, I'm taking, I don't know if I can lift this very long, barnyard manure. Uh, we make our own manures here. This is deodorized. It's not gooey and gross. You could probably take your high heels out and go spread this if you're brave enough, and you won't be all you won't be disgusting afterwards. So it's, we've we've deodorized. We've composted it longer. It's a broad mix of manures. But put that on now. Also, um, areas like rose gardens, flower beds. What will happen starting November? We'll start to get this warm day, very cold nights. We get this freeze-thaw cycle that happens. And the, so the soil by January sometime, it starts to heave or it, gets, it starts to crack. Uh, you'll just see the swelling back and forth, swelling. But the heaving of the soil actually destroys new root hairs. So if you were to put your manures on a two, three-inch layer, or I like to use a lot of shredded cedar bark, this stuff. I use a lot of this in the fall. And the reason I'm doing this is to keep my soil from heaving, to keep it from freezing. I want, I want this, I want the, 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 the bark to heave, not my soil to heave. And so around trees, shrubs, things I want to spring bloom, azaleas, um, I I'll use those. And it doesn't matter which one. In my flower beds, I'm using mainly, my vegetable beds, I'm using mainly manure. Around my trees and shrubs, I don't really use manure, I'm using shredded cedar bark. I'll top dress my containers, I have a lot of container gardens. Uh, you've got some time. It's not like you got to go out this weekend and go get all this done. The month of this month sometime, first part of November, just kind of, this is my checklist. I kind of go down and go, I need to do this, this, this. Uh, don't prune. You Californians, Phoenix, Palm Springs, you folks prune everything in the fall. We don't prune anything until really March. So we'll start pruning most of our things after the new year. 
So grapes, uh, fruit trees, we'll start pruning then. So enjoy the holidays first. Then you'll get bored. If you put on your 10 pounds of holiday weight, you just need to get outside and do something. Uh, there'll be some nice days in January, February, be beautiful. You want to get out and start pruning that. So we want to keep things intact. So, so that extra foliage uh, or, or structure that plant protects the heart of the plant. And so if we get a real harsh winter, which is, we're about due, uh, it'll actually insulate a little bit extra that heart of that plant. We don't insulate roses. We don't cut them back now, put a cage around them, take all the fall leaves, put them over top. We don't do that like they do in the Midwest. We don't get that cold. We just leave them alone, let winter do its thing. Then roses we're pruning in March. So some of those things we're pruning in March. And then don't prune like spring bloomers, like lilacs, forsythia, quince, rhododendrons, azaleas. Don't prune any of that next spring. You prune those after they're done blooming. Hibiscus is more of a summer bloomer. Crepe myrtles, uh, Rosa Sharon's, those things, they're more of a summer. Those you're pruning back. Sages, salvias, all that stuff, you're pruning back in the winter. So New Year's through March. Again, it's a big window. Take your time. You don't have to do it all at once. Uh, although when I go buy a new chainsaw, I do like to give it a good workout. So you just, you can't power it down while it's, while it's you just need more gas. <laughs> so anyway, I didn't mean to mention the pruning thing. We have a whole class next year on pruning. So it's kind of scheduled. So anyway, um, let's see, manures. Replace flowers. Some of my flowers are fading. So I'm pulling those things out. Be aggressive. If your geraniums look even remotely, if there's one yellow leaf, rip that sucker out of the ground to make room for things like pansies. So here, just take that and pass it around. It smells, just take a whiff. That's the flowering stock. I wish I had two, I'd give you one over here. Uh, but things like pansies, I'm planting pansies. I planted pansies a week ago. They've already doubled in size, not doubled, but noticeably larger in size. Pansies love to bloom through winter. So I'm actively trying to rip out some of my summer things, dahlias. I'm trying to make room so I can put some of my winter things through. If you wait until no, you know, end of October, first of November, when everything dies back, yes, you can rip the dead things out. They're gonna die anyway in, in a month. Within three, four weeks, all that summer stuff, the zinnias, they're all gonna be gone. Uh, just know that and have the heart to rip them out early so you get room to get these so they get filled in. What will happen is by Thanksgiving, these will start to shut down and they'll lock into place whatever size they're at. So whatever flowers they have, they'll kind of go, oh, okay, I'm done. They'll wait it out for about a month and a half. And sometime in February, they go, oh, winter's over, and they start to grow again. You want these beefy enough, rooted out enough, flushed enough, flowering enough, to lock into place so they're in full glory. That, if you wait till the frost comes, I find they just look better when I put them in earlier than later because they're actively growing so fast right now. Yep. Yep. Great question. So for you folks online or over here, uh, if you plant calendula or pansies or violas now in a container, how often do you need to water them? I've already started to throttle back my water in my containers. We have over 50 containers. In fact, I'll give you an invite after this. Uh, I'll, I'll mention the garden class, the garden, sure, okay, good. Um, I'm watering about once every three days right now, and I could probably back it off a little bit more. In fact, I shut it off a couple times last week because we had some rain. You can just leave that right there. Hey, let me let the folks online smell it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Here, you should smell this. If you were here, you could smell this too. Come and see us. Flowering stock, it's just a great plant. This will bloom like this. I love this in containers because it raises it up for the fragrance and I like it by the front door. So stock just has this, it's almost sweeter than lilacs. It's so pretty. So I like to have it, it's one of those things, it's, it's an early spring, fall, winter thing is when this looks good. And I find animals don't seem to bother this. Aveline and stuff don't seem to eat it. I don't know why, you'd think they would. I think it's that texture in the foliage they don't like. Uh, they love this one, so be careful. Protect this one. They'll leave this one alone. Calendula. This is a, most folks make a mistake with this one. Oh, back to watering. In the winter, maybe once a week. Yeah, I love to plant pansies for that reason. 
Tansies are like the canary in the whole mine, coal mine for your, for your gardens. They're so talkative. When they get dry, when they get cold, when they get hot, if there's anything going wrong with them, they just lay down and go, oh, it's just about happy. They're really good at laying down in the winter and letting you know, oh, I'm a little bit dry. You water them. Next day, they're like, oh, I'm fine. Okay. So that will kind of give you a gauge uh, on when the soil is starting to go dry. Calendula I like. Most folks, here, these two go together. Calendula, most folks make a mistake with this. They'll come in in, in April and May. Gets up about this tall, kind of covered, just nice little ball-shaped thing. Sends, sends off, this plant will, will quadruple in size and put on 100 or more flowers. If you deadhead them, they set another flower just like that. Most folks plant them too late in the season. So you're coming in in April and May, and then in summer, they kind of go, eh, I'm done. I'm not going to bloom anymore. They're going, well, I thought you were a marigold. I thought you were going to be like a zinnia. I thought you were going to be a summer bloomer, and they're not. This is a spring through really fall through spring bloomer. It's a better choice for it. So also, uh, it's a trivia, if you like flower trivia, uh, um, turmeric. This is like poor man's turmeric. Many times they'll, they'll grind this up and because that's a really expensive spice. This grows everywhere and anywhere, but has kind of a similar flavor. It's edible. You can sprinkle on salads. It's kind of fun. Same with these guys. You want to impress your friends, add a couple of those. Uh, onto a salad, and they're going, oh, you're a gardener, and you have, and you eat flowers. That's amazing. Snapdragons, uh, I'm replacing a lot of my containers now with snapdragons, because this is a tall thing. Uh, and then I'll put things like this. this. This is an instantaneous garden. Where's my other one? Instant garden. Just do that together. Tall thing, lower thing. It just looks good. Um, so I'm doing a lot of this right now. This will bloom until the end of the year. Finally, it will have this tall flower spike, and uh, it'll, it'll stop blooming, usually about Christmas. And I'll cut off the flower stalks, and I just get this nice green foliage, which is pretty. It doesn't die back to the ground. It still looks green, but then these guys really start to shine because you got the green with the flowers. It just looks really good. I'll fertilize this with, uh, usually at the end of January, first of February, start to take off right again, and by the end, by Valentine's to March 1, somewhere in there, it just it's in full bloom again, right through all of spring. So, and deer, javelina, pack rats, they don't bother snapdragons. They reseed. They're just a good, they're not a wildflower. They kind of think they are sometimes. So it's a good, good, strong plant for here. So again, we have not, this is the first crop. We've not had this for since, since May, really. So now we finally got this in. We've got a several crop rotations coming with different colors of snapdragons because now's the time to plant them. Okay. Um, I think the same thing with uh, herbs. So be careful. Watch your basil. Watch your tomatoes. We're going to get frost by the end of this month, highly likely. And basil is kind of a kind of a baby. It gets below 45 degrees. It goes, I'm so cold. I don't like it here. So it's a yellow, get weepy. So harvest, make those pestos, use those things here. Probably in the next two, three weeks, you're going to want to harvest all that and use it. So that's one of the few that is an annual. It won't winter, winter over. Most perennials, like this lavender, this is a perennial. It comes back year after year after year. As long as you don't water it too much in winter. It's easy to kill these in the winter. They don't really, they want to be neglected, forgotten, and just look good. These look great in containers. So we've got a big oxblood red container, the great big old uh, uh, lavender in it. It's just beautiful. It's evergreen, has that great smell to it. Uh, rosemary's the same way. It's got a great uh, evergreen texture. Mine's in bloom right now. So it'll bloom and then it'll take a break as soon as we get frost. It'll be in bloom again in, in like March. It'll start to bloom again. It's one of the first things to bloom in spring. So when those bees first start coming out, there's nothing for them to eat. They're all over the, the rosemary because one of the few they're foraging, trying to find some food. Um, and that's one of the food sources for them. So think of evergreen plants as well. Blooming and evergreen plants are, are great. You start planting those now. Okay. All lavenders are, if you're going to kill them, all of them, uh, you're going to kill them by overwatering or a soil that just doesn't perk. So that's why containers are so good for them, raised beds. 
because uh, the soil generally drains better than in the ground. It just depends on where you're at. So out towards Granite Mountain, that ground is real granity, kind of sandy. Drainage is better, at least that top layer. Um, they seem to thrive better. Out that 69 corridor, you got to be careful not to overwater them or they're going to croak on you. So I, I've killed many, many lavenders. And manz I can't grow manzanita in my backyard. I wish I've tried. I, they grow right down the way, but my soil is just too heavy and too hard. So an invite. I told, I told, I told you to invite you. Um, if you want, how do I do that too? The sign-up sheet or how do we get folks, how do we get the invite to them? Yeah. Yeah. Well, wherever that sheet is, we can do that. We'll just RSVP. Oh, it has it. Oh, hey, here we go. Perfect. Thank you. That's why I got, I got a great staff that makes me look way better than I should. Um, here you go. So I've got two handouts for you. So I've got, uh, not the planting spec. Yeah, okay. So I've got two handouts for you, how to fertilize. The other one is, uh, I'm writing an article right now, the 34 perennials you should, you should prune in fall. So I'm, that's probably in a couple of weeks, I'll have that coming out. It's, not, it's a pretty extensive list. And I find it keeps growing. So I gotta prune it back or the paper won't print it. So I gotta get, I got a balancing act yet. I'll send that to you as well, because that pertains to this class. And there was one other I was going to send. What was the other one? Yeah, the fertilizer one. Oh, yeah, the five things you want to. Yeah, gotcha. So there's two handouts. If you want to be invited to a garden tour of my class, of my home, of my our gardens, we're going to do that on Friday at 4 o'clock. It's RSVP only. It's not to the mass humanities. So put RSVP on next to your email address. We'll make sure you get a link. Is that it's going to be virtual in person. It, it just didn't make sense to gather together a big group of people. It's COVID starting to go get bad again. So we decided to do it virtually. So we're going to have a, a personal tour of our gardens. How we designed it, why we designed it, why it's that way, how it's changed. We'll show a lot of container gardens. I'm thinking about how to incorporate the nighttime gardens. I might do a separate segment, just shoot that, because we do a lot of uplighting and art. I mean, it feels like a resort. And the front yard, if you've been by our house, it's pretty, it's okay. The backyard is over the top. I mean, we're talking waterfalls and creeks and ponds, art. We used to be an art dealer, outdoor art stuff. So we've had a lot of that. So we'll show all that off. Friday. We'll try to capture that too. I'm not quite sure how we're going to capture that in video form and then show it off later. So it'll be available later, but it'll be much more personal. Give it ask questions and stuff at the end if you choose. So put RSVP. That's a personal invite for you folks as well. Maybe put your email in the comment field and we can, we can make sure you're on that list as well. So that invites for you all as well. We, we realize you couldn't quite make it in today. We want you to be included. Okay, so enough on that. Go back to my list, where am I at? Right there. So it's actually, we never allow anyone to come to our gardens. It's our respite pit, it's our, it's our, it's our unplug. We live life in front of humanity. 34,000 customers, 35 I think, went through here this, this year. That's a lot of people going through. You have no privacy at all. You got to watch how you drive. You got to watch how you go to church, where you sit. You got to make sure you, you buy the right things at the grocery store. You got to really be aware of what's going on because people are watching. At our house, we have a plug and it's just us. It's only family and very close friends have ever been in our backyard. We're asked often to be on garden tours. And I just go, I have no interest. So literally, you'll be one of the first ones to see our gardens. I don't know how it will capture on film because it's hard to capture gardens like going to the Grand Canyon and oh my gosh, take a picture. It's just not the same. But I think we can get we can explain some of that to you. So you can see at least some design ideas, how to put together privacy screens, how to use evergreens, how to do big patios. Our patio is as wide as our house. Big. It's made for, for entertaining. So anyway, okay. Some flowers. Do, 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 do. Irrigation clocks. Let's go over irrigation. So by the end of the month, I would say by the first of 
November. In November, if you've got a gardener or irrigation company or landscape company, someone's taking care of your garden for you, they're going to want to turn off the irrigation. And I guess that's okay. But you do need to water through winter. So you may have to water by hand if you need to, especially if you have a lot of new plants, a new tree, a new shrub, brand new blaze maple out there, um, and it's not quite rooted yet. It's, it's dependent on you for some water. Plants don't shut down here like they do in the Midwest. We don't get a frost line. It's, we, don't, we don't have permafreeze. It just kind of locks everything in place until spring. Plants are actively growing using, using water through winter. So right now, through the end of the month, you're watering a regular, like right, once a week, you're watering plants. Starting in November, we can cut that back to about twice a month, okay? November through March, about twice a month. Uh, if your irrigation's off, the backflow preventer's been blown out, and all that kind of stuff, I realize that happens. Go take a hose out there. Pick a nice day and go, I want to I wanna go make my plants happy. Just water them in, especially the new things, okay? Uh, also, I'll start changing my clock. Right now, I'm, I'm, I'm at dawn, usually 3, 4, 5 o'clock in the morning. I've got the, those irrigation systems activated. And I want to water everything by 8 o'clock in the morning. That will change November. I'll change that to middle of the day. Because we're getting frosty now. We're, getting, we're seeing some freeze in the morning. If I water in the dawn and it's 28 degrees out, I'm going to see ice. I don't want that. That's bad for plants. I'm going to water during the day. So I'll back that into 10 to 2. Somewhere in there I'll start watering. Because we, we, never, we never see freezing middle of the day. That's Wisconsin stuff. We didn't, that's the reason you moved down here. So we don't have that freezing cold. And it's nice during the day, but cold at night. Water during the day. So also make sure you're, you're insulating your, uh, maybe it's time to freshen up you folks on wells. You just don't want those well houses to freeze. So I'll, right now my, my heat tape, heat lamps, insulation, the windows are even open in the, in the irrigation shed. So, but by the end of this month, I'll close the windows, put the insulation back in, plug the heat tape back in, make sure the heat lamp turns on because you don't want that pump and stuff. It's a $1,000 pump. You don't want it to freeze. So you want to make sure you maintain that irrigation. No, not everyone's on irrigation, but just put it on your list by the end of the month. Okay, where else are we at? Good, all-purpose food. We already covered that. Oh, all-purpose plant food, this stuff. Greatest lawn food ever. Any lawns? Anyone have a lawn? Even for the puppy dogs? One, that's about right. It, 20 years ago, we'd say any lawns, only one person didn't have a lawn. Now only one person does. But best lawn food ever. And if you put that on, it'll keep it green. It'll really help. Reseeding. October is your month to reseed or extend lawns. March and October are your two best months for reseeding or, or just starting lawns in the mountains of Arizona. Th this elevation, for sure. Ma March and October. Foot yeah. And you can't get under it. Yeah. So this stuff is what you want to use for evergreens. What's the best way to fertilize? Now, first of all, with big trees, she's got a great big tree with just big tree. It's even hard to see underneath it. That's okay. You mainly want that food on the outer edge anyway. So for me, I just I'm gonna put this down. It's so heavy. It's bothering my tennis elbow. Dang it. Um, so for me, I, I love my hand spreader. I just go through and I make it as happy as I can. I just sprinkle around. And with big trees, their roots are going out way beyond their, their drip system. You're almost feeding the tree over there by fertilizing this tree over here. And they're just picking up the food from all over the yard. They've probably found their way to the lawn, the flower beds, and your drip irrigation. So as you fertilize those lilacs you planted three years ago, you're also fertilizing the trees. Just get it on there. Sometimes you, that's where spikes, some, remember the old Job's, uh, Tree spikes, you, you put it in the ground and feeds for a year. That's true, it does do that. The question is, is it feeding in the right place for the year? Because you never knew where the roots are. And so a granular is far better because you can get a much more even pattern. The plant takes it up better. So we stopped selling Job spikes two decades ago when we made this because it just works so much better. So just get it on. Don't worry. Don't overthink it. I know this is hard for gardeners. Just get, be generous and be, be seasonally correct, get it on the right time, and it makes the most difference. So it'll all correct itself, yeah. What if you're, it's rock, can you just throw that on top of the rock? 
you know, you're the front row. Weren't you listening? I said, put it right over the rocks, right over the fabric. <laughs> this, we got the three amigas right here in the front row. They're all chit-chatting. They missed that one. So, okay, yeah, it'll go right through the rock. You don't have to worry about it. If there, there are some little texture to it that bothers you. You could rake it or hose it down, go in the bottom of the rock, and then it'll, it'll just go through the fabric. As we get snow and rain, it'll break down. So it's perfectly fine. Now you made me lose track where it was. You're okay. All you runners, those fancy shoes. So I'll activate her. We, uh, do, 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 do. I think we're good. Questions? Oh, bonus question. A mountain burner. Yep, gotcha. So I'll email. I'll put this on there too in case you lose it or whatever. Well, you'll, you'll get a copy. You want to share it with a friend, you can, you can pass that on. Feel free to pass it on. We want to help people be better gardeners. That's our goal here. And if we do that and folks have some success, we think you'll support us over the years. And that has worked for us for 60 years. Uh, just be generous. Help people garden better. They'll support you. So anyway, questions, any last things? So we went 40, 50 minutes in. Yep. 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 So she's got a, this is not just calla lilies or lilies in general. Hold on just a sec. Something's going on up towards Williamson Valley. Tune in for more. Uh, so, um, so a lot of things. So I grow a lot of zone eight stuff. This is borderline. So I've got very fancy cacti, uh, barrel cactus, uh, fish, red fish hooks, very unusual, rare cacti, just funky, different. I saw it and went, oh, that's, I wonder if I could grow that. It's been successful. Uh, some different kinds of uh, Mediterranean ground cover type of, type of cacti, palm trees, olives. These are all very borderline. It's zone eight. We are a zone seven or six. So you can grow things without even thinking about it. Zone one through seven. As soon as you go to eight, 19, 11, 12, that's more Phoenix stuff. So eight, what I do with mine, so I'll cut them back, clean them up. I do mulch them up. I'll, I'm, I'm, I'll make sure I top off that soil because more soil, more water holding capacity that soil has, the hardier it is. For things that are really borderline, I pull them up close to the house. So I'm growing some hardy bananas, freakishly, beautiful. You go out and go, oh, where am I? California? Oh my gosh, so pretty. Um, but it dies back to the ground. But I'll make sure that pot is touching the house and the house throws off an amazing amount of heat. You'd just be a surprise. And it insulates it enough. I don't cover it. I don't take it. If it dies, if it's been a good ride, I go sayonara, goodbye, it's good. I'll plant something else. Uh, but I just, I don't take a lot of work out of it. My dahlias, I don't dig up out of the ground and then store in the garage for over winter. It's just more work than I want. I'll throw some mulch over top of those so the root doesn't freeze. And most years, it comes back. What we do is about every 10, 12 years, be with in just a second. Every 10 or 12 years, we go sub-zero. They're not predicting that this year, but you never... What I found is never believe the weatherman. Uh, but when it does go sub-zero, it obliterates a lot of different things. So it just it's there, there it's a different variable. Most years, just just care for it at all. The main thing in pots, since we've got a couple container gardener folks, make sure you're watering those containers. And what I do with my containers, if I hear there's a storm coming, you, you know what it's like. Oh, there's a northwest. Storm coming. It's going to be cold. There's going to be snow. People run to the grocery store. They obliterate all the shelves, take things home. They hunker down for a week and a half. When you see that coming, water your plants before that system gets here. A hydrated plant goes to the cold much better than a dry plant. It seems counterintuitive. You think that if I'm wet, I'll be colder. Not with plants. If they're hydrated, that antifreeze is naturally within the structure of that plant is, is more fluid and it's able to protect that plant better. If the plant is dry, you'll see this next spring, uh, you'll see uh, uh, the tips of red tip potinias, uh, evergreens, uh, eleagnus, the tips of, of plants will be damaged, They're like it got burned, we call it winter burn or winter kill. That's a plant that, that was not watered over the winter. It, got, it went through a cold spell when it was dry and it burned back the tips. That's why, if you water it, that doesn't happen, just like that. So. 
Yes, so the Kellas specifically, canna lilies to cut them back. Yes, cut them back. Enjoy the flowers till November sometime. Then they're gonna die back, cut them off, put the soil on them, water them. Not just water them once, water them at least every 10, 14 days. So, and if you see a cold spell coming, water them before the cold gets here. And that will ensure that it comes through better. Yeah. Those are pretty plants. Right? This is a good year for cannas. Oh my gosh, they were stunning. So anything else? Yep. Oh, I know I wanted to get her for I told her to hold on. Let me then I'll come back. Don't don't let me don't let me jump ahead. So here's a lesson. So before I have the tour on Friday, it's probably after we're done showing off the gardens, we'll probably be in the back enjoying it when it's all done. Uh, fire pits are going, all kinds of stuff. I go and hose things down with Sayonara. Gets rid of the mosquitoes, gets rid of flies. Whenever I have a garden backyard barbecue, a couple days prior, it hits Sayonara, gets rid of, if you have one mosquito at our house, I got a bunch of female. I mean, I raise daughters. Uh, th if there's one mosquito, they're out of there. They're inside where it's over. The party's over. No mosquitoes are allowed, and fry, you know, flies destroy all, all backyard barbecues. Just no flies are allowed. So you've got fly traps around, but then I go ahead and I make sure nothing is going to come and bother us. And, and this seems to last for a couple of weeks or so. I don't have mosquitoes in that area. Mosquitoes are bad this year. Uh, mayflies, they're eating the mosquitoes. So they're, they're, they're spooky, scary things. They're just big. Anyway, they get in the house, and they're freaky. This, this is what I would do. I put a hose in spray and I just hose down. They're going to hang out during the, in the darker parts of the garden. Big, uh, thick shrubs, ground covers. Um, anyway, just do that for, for, May, for, for any kind of fly, mosquito, that kind of stuff. Yep. Also, another, I, I mentioned this too. I brought this over. didn't mean to mention it. I noticed in my office, I'm seeing that, tra that glossy trail of snails and slugs. So they're loving this kind of weather. If you see that classic snail and slug uh, type of, of trail, put down a bait. This is all organic. It's a fancy iron, basically. It's in a pellet form. It's not going to go after your dogs, your, the birds, that kind of stuff. Just goes after specifically snail and slugs, maybe some earwigs, a few, few other things. But just sprinkle that around where you see that. Uh, they seem to like my yarrow. They like the vincas, the, the ground cover group vincas. It's where they kind of hang out. I'll, I'll sprinkle some of this. This is, this is probably going over. It's not even going to leave the class. It's going to go across the way and kill off snail and slugs. Kind of watch for that one. Things are active because it's so cool and it's so moist. So there's more bugs than usual. We're seeing uh, grubs underneath fruit trees. So a lot of customers are coming in with grub damage. So if you see that, you sprinkle. So they've got a bait that you sprinkle down there. It's not the snail and slug. It's a, uh, do I have it? This is, uh, this is for edibles. You can put it at the base of your grapes, berries, fruit trees specifically, apples, peaches, cherries, nectarines. Um, it'll take out the things that live in the soil. So there, you were seeing a lot of damage because everything's growing better. Weeds are growing better. Trees are growing better. Bugs are growing better. Just, be, just know you don't want those things going, hibernating in your yard over winter so they can come back and haunt you next spring. Okay? Yep, in the back. I'm gonna, oh, we got everything over here? We're all set. How about online? Any questions? Yeah. Last chance? Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Okay. So, uh, first of all, uh, Luann wants to know what she could do about rats in the garden. <laughs> oh, rats. Luann, poor Luann. Oh, my gosh, rats. We, we not only have rats. We got a southern rat that's on steroids. Great big beady eyes. I think they rotate like... Uh, in different directions, long tail. It's like a small cat. They call them pack rats. They're highly active right now. And they'll really become highly active. They'll look into your RV, your bar built-in barbecue, the hot tubs, they're gonna love those. So things are gonna start coming at you, coming into the house, because they wanna stay warm too. So you start seeing these sticks and stuff gathering places. Those are all pack rats. So you'll see out in the forest uh, in, inside of uh, scrub oak, Manzanitas, these big, big piles of debris, those are pack rat nests. If you pick one of those apart, this is how obsessive compulsive I am. If you pick one of those apart, you'll see two or three nests, like bird nests underneath that. They're very cute, very quaint. 
They're adorable. That's, they're just cute. Uh, I don't want them in my house. I want them at your house, but not at my house. Uh, so what to do? So I've got a trap line. I mean, just old fashioned trap line. I just take pet rat traps in the backyard. I've got three of them and I put a little peanut butter, I mean, pumpkin seeds. They love, they can't resist pumpkin seeds uh, in the trap. And then I'll just, you got to deal with a dead thing. So she's going to get them. Uh, but I, I want, I, there's a halo effect where I don't want, I don't want rats anywhere around my gardens because they destroy everything. They get in the sheds, they get into the, they've eaten a hole into my hot tub. Five, ten thousand dollar hot tub. Rats are in it. That is unacceptable. Not going to happen at the Lane Casa. Not going to happen. So I have, a, I have a rat trap. In the front yard where the dogs aren't, I've got actually bait stations. They have a make fancy plastic thing you can put bait into and I put that in there. I don't use strychnine ever because it has a secondary kill rate, but it's zinc based types of baits I use in my front yard. They get into your car, they get into, the, they build, they destroy it. If you leave a car apart for a couple of weeks, you're going to have rats in it just like that. And they love the rock piles and that kind of stuff. So watch those and the ground squirrels. Those, that's how you deal with them. Yeah. Great. So amaryllis. Do you leave amaryllis in the ground or do you pull them up? Who's that from? Can you tell where she's from? I know her name. That's awesome. Debbie. Debbie. Oh, great. Thanks for tuning in, Debbie. So, yeah, and I don't even know why I asked that. Can, we could probably track that because it's all digital, but that's scary. Uh, anyway, um, amaryllis, it is not a perennial. If it freezes back, it's dead. So an amaryllis, you do want to probably cut back, dig up, and store inside, uh, or it will die. So that's, that's kind of a, up here at this elevation. I know you outside, down, let's say Black Canyon City and lower, it could stay in the ground. Up here, it's going to freeze. By the way, she wants you to know she lives near Williams. Oh, awesome, William. <laughs> awesome. I have a friend that wants to go off grid. I said, go to, go to Ash Fork or Seligman. All of them, everyone's off grid. Go up there. Anyway, what else? Yeah. Yep. So Mandavia is all, the, so all of your summer annuals. In fact, I think I've got an article coming out next week. If you're on our regular... If you read the courier or, or get our newsletter next week or the week after, it's how to bring the outside in. So that is one that will not winter over. So if you want to keep your mandavias, your geraniums, those things, you want to keep those alive. You want to either you want to bring them indoors, kiss them goodbye, say it's been a good ride, or give them to friends down in Phoenix where it doesn't freeze, which is why I've got family down there. So just go, here, it's time. They all winter them over down there, and I get geraniums that are <laughs> this big back up the hill. Will they winter in the garage? Like, isn't it possible? Yes, they will winter in the garage uh, just fine. They might look a little weak. I mean, unless it's a real bright garage, it doesn't matter. You're just trying to get them to live. You're going to bring them back out, usually in April, fertilize them, trim them back, and then they'll take off with new growth again. So and if, if you make a mistake... I know where you can buy a new one next spring. <laughs> Happens to be Waters Garden Center. So anyway, that's, that's, you, but try it. I've got folks that take their geraniums. They cut them they, harsh. They cut them right back. Nothing's left. They put them in that crawl space, like the, oh, yeah. like the di dirt area back underneath the second story, of, underneath the house. They just store them back there. Bring them out in the spring and they, they live. I'm stunned they do that, but I've heard that story many times. So the, the plants want to live. Yeah. So do you water them if they're in storage? Yes. I would say don't let the root ball dry out, but it doesn't take very much moisture to keep a plant alive. In your dugout area, that unfinished basement or whatever, it takes hardly any because it's so dark, just it's moist, humid, and it's dark. But in the garage, you're probably going to water a little more. In the house, you treat them like a house plant. What is that, every seven, ten days or so? You know, water them? That's, that's enough. So it just depends on where it's at. And we got a lot of folks tuned in, so it could be anywhere. Yeah. So you put what in around your evergreens? Soaker hose. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, that's a great idea. So during that heat, so this is like before the monsoons, like sometime in July, the monsoons hit. 
Uh, before that, it was just bone dry. And she'd taken soaker hoses and watered her evergreens with soaker hoses. Brilliant move. For me, I didn't want to sling soaker hoses. Plus, I had one of those spray sprinkler heads of metal kind of just spits up in a spray. I just did that once a month, added to my, my regular drip system. That kept them alive. Now they look fabulous. I've got a weeping sequoia that is to die for. You're going to be so impressed. It's huge. Probably the biggest one in the county. It's back below the pond. I didn't know it would grow here, but it grows really well here. So, But I had to keep it. I had to kind of take the edge off. But with all the rain, it's really beautiful. Your evergreens... Going back to that, make sure you fertilize your evergreens. What will happen is if you don't fertilize them, they'll get winter chlorosis or this yellowing effect to them. Usually in January, February, you get this off look. And so if you just fertilize them now, it takes care of that. It really eliminates. You can tell. I can drive through a neighborhood, and I can just tell who fertilized who didn't. You can just tell by the health of the plant in January and February how they look. Okay. I would say fertilize them. Yeah, she's got lots of evergreens and lots of soaker hoses, but she needs to fertilize them. I'd say go now, do it at your convenience now. It's fine. One last question, then we got to cut off. We go in one hour. I like to go one hour if we can. If not, I'll let you clap for yourselves, including you folks online. Hey, if you could online, uh, just make a comment or just say hey, good class or something positive because Google really likes that. They rank us better. Anyway, as a small company, it's hard to get seen. All the big companies get all the SEO. They get all the fancy folks. But just one comment gets us to the top. We'd appreciate that. I will hang out here. If I didn't get to something, want to take a look at the plants. Um, I meant to go into plants more, but sorry. We got into technical stuff. And then you're free to go. Thanks, you all. Thank you. Yeah, you betcha.